Hello and uh, welcome to today's webinar sponsored by uh, Dr. Yusuf Hamid. Uh, I'm Jeremy Sanders and I oversee uh, the Chemistry Department's engagement programme with alumni and, and friends. Uh, tonight, well, or this morning or this afternoon, depending where you are, um, we're going to be hearing from Professor Thomas Knowles uh, and Nadia Erkamp about their work looking at the fundamental um, mechanisms behind Alzheimer's and similar uh, degenerative diseases. Uh, Thomas will, will give us uh, uh, some background about why it's such an important topic, will show us uh, some of the work that uh, his group's been doing, and then he'll pass on to Nadia, who's a PhD student working in his group. Uh, but the, those, their talks will be introduced by Dr. Sven Royal, who is supporting uh, Nadia's PhD work in Thomas's group. And in a moment, Sven uh, will tell us, uh, will, will provide an introduction uh, as to uh, why he was so interested to do this. But before I pass over to Sven, uh, I should say that um, we will leave plenty of time for a question and answer session at the end. So as we go along, if you have uh, any questions or comments, you can put them in the Q&A. Um, you can click the Q&A tab on your screen and you can put the question in and I will deal, we'll deal with as many of the questions as we can towards the end. We will be recording uh, the talks, uh, but not the Q&A section so that uh, at some time uh, quite soon in the future, the talks will go on the department website and our YouTube channel. So uh, with that, I'm going to pass over to Sven Royal. Sven. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, depending on where you are. Jeremy and I have known each other for over 40 years. Professor Sanders was my supervisor in my last year as an undergraduate in Cambridge, and we've kept in touch over the last four decades or so. About three years ago, he brought to my attention a very effective and efficient way uh, of supporting research in the department. And I found that very attractive for a number of reasons. On a personal level, uh, it enabled me to repay a debt of gratitude for my education all those years ago. It helps keep me in touch with the department and it provides tangible support for their research programs. On an emotional level, uh, I know from my own family experience the, the ravaging effects on independence uh, and dignity that neurodegenerative diseases can cause. And it, it's a problem that will become more prevalent uh, with an aging population. So this is a very relevant area of research for a societal problem. For chemistry in Cambridge, uh, there are also some benefits. The unconditional backing of the judgment and ingenuity of a leading scientist allows the department uh, to pursue very ambitious research projects, which perhaps understandably a research council being more cautious might not want to, uh, to sponsor. Uh, and, and so I think that's a very important uh, area for furthering blue skies research. And equally, the, the lack of um, red tape and bureaucracy surrounding the award means that the chemistry department can be very agile in attracting and retaining outstanding candidates to come to Cambridge to further their understanding of chemistry and to demonstrate their undoubted flair for scientific research. I hope that explains my presence uh, in this webinar. And I very much hope that some of you participating will come to the same conclusion about the uh, importance and attraction of supporting chemistry in Cambridge. And so without further ado, let me hand over to Professor Knowles and uh, Nadia Erkamp to tell us about this very interesting and, and uh, exciting area of research. So Thomas, over to you. So uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeremy and uh, Sven for the kind introduction. It's a real pleasure uh, to have this chance to tell you about the research that we're carrying out here at the Department of Chemistry at the University of Cambridge. And I will focus on our efforts to understand and discover the fundamental molecular mechanisms that underpin the onset of dementia and indeed other protein misfolding related uh, diseases. I'll also tell you how we're increasingly understanding the natural protective mechanisms in our bodies that keep us healthy and prevent these aberrant processes from happening for the vast majority of our lives. And finally, uh, I'll share some thoughts about how we can use uh, these learnings in order to evaluate uh, the currently available uh, therapeutics, but more crucially, actually design next generation of therapeutics uh, with increased uh, efficacy. 
And I should say this is work uh, that has been uh, carried out here uh, in Cambridge by a really fantastic set of PhD students and postdocs with whom I have a real privilege of uh, working in my research group here. Also, a lot of this work has been done uh, in collaboration with colleagues, both here in Cambridge, uh, but also overseas. And this is really one of the absolutely wonderful features of our Cambridge. We have the chance here to, to work with absolutely some of the brightest and best uh, students who come from all over the world, uh, come here to Cambridge, uh, and we work together to move forward some of the uh, most, uh, most challenging but important areas of, um, of modern, uh, modern science. And one of the things I'm very proud of uh, is actually how well uh, these, students, uh, these students do. And it's really a source of particular uh, delight and pride that actually over the past 15 years or so that we've been running this program, many of these students now have their own uh, professorships, have secured professorships in leading international uh, research uh, universities and have started and established their own uh, research groups, thus expanding the community of scientists and researchers who are advancing this critically important area of understanding the causes uh, and uh, uh, the mechanisms of uh, neurodegenerative uh, diseases. We've been very fortunate uh, as well that this research has secured funding uh, from the research councils, uh, but also we're particularly fortunate uh, to have been able to benefit from uh, support from uh, foundations, charitable foundations, um, uh, but also individual uh, donors. And in particular, it's, it's really the long-term support from the Francis and Augustus Newman Foundation and from Derek Finley and the Finley family, uh, which has allowed us to establish our research program uh, here in, in Cambridge. Uh, and of course, more recently, uh, Sven uh, Royal and his uh, support to establish a royal uh, studentship uh, has allowed uh, Nadia Erkamp uh, to come here uh, to Cambridge to carry out her PhD research in this important area. And you will hear later uh, about the really fantastic work uh, that she has already uh, been able to uh, carry out. I should say uh, that the fact that uh, there are sort of a set of people out there who really share our passion and our vision for advancing what's really a challenging area of science, but a critically important uh, area of science, this really fundamentally gives us the support to realize our research program, but it's also a continuous source of inspiration and motivation for both us and the people uh, who work with us and really underpins everything uh, that we do here uh, in Cambridge. So our research is very generally focused on understanding the molecular basis for biological function and malfunction. So if we take a, an organ, for example, here, the brain, which will be the focus of uh, my presentation uh, today, if we zoom in, uh, what we find is we find the fundamental units of life, the uh, living cell, in this case, neuronal cells. And if we then ask the question, we go further, we ask the question, well, what actually makes uh, a living cell uh, work? It turns out that the answer to that is in large part protein. So these are really the molecules which form the machinery of life. And the way they work is actually very interesting. So proteins are sociable molecules. They have to interact with other proteins in order to form functional complexes. And this is the machinery of life. This is what makes the cell uh, work. But if you look at the picture like this, uh, it sort of immediately raises the question of how is it possible in this crowded environment inside a living cell, how is it possible for proteins to reliably find the correct partner to interact with? And how do proteins avoid uh, interacting in an inappropriate way uh, with proteins that they're not supposed to interact with? And so what I'll tell you today is that uh, unfortunately, this doesn't actually always happen in the intended way. And indeed, in some cases, actually proteins do get trapped, get stuck uh, with interactions that they're really not supposed to carry out as part of their biological role. And this typically leads to very damaging uh, structures that are formed, which are not functional and are associated with disease. And this is really one of the very fundamental events that underpins the onset and development of uh, dementias and other neurodegenerative uh, diseases. So if we zoom out um, a little bit, this is sort of the general view of uh, protein phase behavior. Uh, so what proteins uh, do here, these, these folded uh, states, which are the functional states, what they do is they come together in order to form these uh, complexes which are uh, really part of the machinery of life. This is what makes a cell work. It turns out that there's, there's other types of assemblies that uh, proteins can uh, form. For example, these uh, slightly less well-ordered liquid-like uh, droplet uh, states, biological condensates, which exist both in the nucleus of living cells, but also in the cytoplasm. Uh, these are increasingly um, recognized as being absolutely key in organizing the molecules in the cell in both uh, time and space. And you'll hear from uh, Nadia about the really fantastic work uh, that she's been doing in, in understanding the, the properties of these uh, important assemblies. 
So both these functional complexes and uh, liquid conocytes, these are examples of functional self-assembly. However, uh, in some cases, proteins interact with uh, partners that they are not supposed to interact with, or even in some cases with a, with a partner they're supposed to interact with, but in an inappropriate way. And that typically leads uh, to intractable uh, structures, solid structures, which are very difficult for biological systems to get rid of once they form. Uh, these are commonly known as amyloid fibers or amyloid-like fibers. And their connection uh, is, is almost uh, universally with uh, disease-associated uh, phenomena. And actually, this connection between protein aggregation, amyloid formation, and, and disease is not actually uh, new. So we've known about this for many, many years. And in fact, it was discovered by uh, the German pathologist uh, Aloha Alzheimer, who over 100 years ago was studying a patient, Augusta Dieter, who, um, who was suffering from, a, from an unusual form of dementia. So she was in her early 50s and had come down with a very severe form of dementia, uh, which today, um, of course, we know is, a, is an early onset form of what's uh, now, of course, known as Alzheimer's uh, disease. So unfortunately, what happened, uh, of course, is the, is the patient passed away and Alzheimer was able to study uh, the brain of, the, of, of this patient. And he was able to discover that there were really a series of very abnormal events that had taken place. So first of all, there was really a loss of neuronal mass, as you can see in this, in this image of an Alzheimer's brain compared to a healthy brain. So really very serious loss of neuronal mass. And even on a molecular level, uh, Alzheimer was, was able to really discover the fact that there were, there were sort of abnormal protein deposits, which were definitely not supposed to be there in healthy uh, brain tissue. And there were deposits outside of the cells in the extracellular space. We know now that these are formed from the amyloid beta peptide, and I will talk about this peptide in more detail in a couple of slides. Um, but uh, Alzheimer was also able to show that there were deposits also inside neuronal uh, cells. And we know now that these are formed from a different protein, the tau protein. Uh, these are known as tau tangles and also an absolutely critical uh, driver of these, um, of these uh, diseases. So we work on many of these proteins, including also tau, but I won't have the chance to uh, talk in detail about that uh, here uh, today. So despite the fact uh, that we have known about this uh, problem for over 100 uh, years or so, it has been remarkably challenging to actually do anything uh, very much uh, about this issue. And even today, we don't have effective, widely available uh, therapeutics uh, to combat any of these protein aggregation diseases, in fact, but in particular, this is the case for uh, Alzheimer's disease and uh, other forms of uh, dementia, which have a very similar molecular molecular origin. And actually together, this class of diseases, if we just look at uh, dementias, which Alzheimer's is the most common example, they actually already in the UK are one of the leading uh, causes of death and actually contribute to almost uh, as much uh, death and, and, and suffering really than all types of cancers together. So this is really, this is really a very dramatic uh, situation. And even in the past um, a sort of year or so where we've had um, very unfortunate tragic disruption from the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, it actually turns out that even in this case, um, it, it has been disproportionately the sufferers of dementia who have been affected uh, by, this, uh, by this virus. And so one of the reasons why the situation has arisen is because uh, in other areas of biomedical science, including, for example, in infectious disease, as we've seen with the development of uh, vaccines against COVID-19, but also in metabolic disease, uh, but in particular in uh, cancers, we increasingly understand the biology, the molecular mechanisms that give rise to these, these diseases. And, and for example, in cancer, this has really given rise to an absolute transformation where, where the therapeutic potential and possibilities have, have completely changed over the past 20 uh, 30 years or so. And this has uh, resulted in, in many more people now uh, surviving, surviving cancer, which is absolutely wonderful development uh, and a huge triumph really of modern uh, biomedical science. Unfortunately, however, uh, the sufferers of dementia have, have not benefited from a similar uh, type of progress. And we still don't understand the fundamental mechanisms which cause proteins to depart from the normal healthy soluble states and form these intractable insoluble amyloid deposits uh, which are associated with the onset and the development of these diseases. And this is really what has led to, uh, to this becoming an ever-increasing problem, and it's, and it's now really at a stage where al almost all of us have uh, members of our families who, who are affected by these really, uh, really tragic uh, diseases. Unfortunately, uh, it's very likely that this problem will become even worse uh, unless we can find effective ways of intervening. 
And the reason for that is, is actually very uh, simple. And that's because if we look at the major risks associated here with Alzheimer's disease, it turns out that the strongest risk factor is actually age. So for people below the age of uh, 65, what happens is that we have protective mechanisms in our, in our bodies, uh, which actually manage to curtail this, these aberrant associations, protein aggregation, uh, for, the, for the, really for the majority of our lives, very well, certainly under the age of 65. And I'll tell you a little bit more about these systems, in particular molecular chaperone uh, systems, and what we can learn uh, from understanding how they work. However, these chaperone systems decrease in efficiency as we age, and as a consequence, uh, what happens is that the uh, prevalence of these protein misfolding diseases, in particular here, Alzheimer's disease, really increases with age, uh, all the way up to these sort of quite alarming numbers for people above the age of, of 90. And that has sort of wide ranging consequences. For example, if we think about which parts of the world, for example, have this type of aging population. So at the moment, if we set a threshold, for example, of 20% of the population uh, being above the age of 65, where really this risk um, for dementia and other protein misfolding associated diseases becomes very significant. Uh, we see that these, these are largely sort of Western uh, countries, uh, plus maybe, maybe Japan. But uh, because of the progress in biomedical sciences in other areas, life expectancy is raising. And so if you now ask the same question in less than uh, 30 years time, the picture looks very different. So this will really become a phenomenon which is prevalent uh, absolutely uh, worldwide. And it's actually even more uh, dramatic in the sense that uh, I've shown you here examples of Alzheimer's disease, but there's actually 50, over 50 other diseases which share the same uh, molecular misbehavior in a sense where proteins associate incorrectly uh, with each other to form these intractable amyloid structures. So for example, uh, alpha-synuclein in Parkinson's disease, uh, Huntington's disease, motor neuron disease, and, and even some forms of type two diabetes have very strong connections with these types of aberrant uh, protein behavior on the molecular uh, scale. So we work in fact with uh, all of these proteins, uh, all of these proteins here I'll today focus largely on the beta peptide and its association with, association with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, but just to uh, sort of uh, show you that actually for this whole category of diseases, these protein misfolding diseases, for none of them do we really have effective and widely available disease modifying therapies. And so the numbers actually don't look any better for any of these other diseases. So you know, just as, a, as an example for, for Parkinson's disease, situation is equally uh, dramatic. And in fact, if you look at, look at some of these numbers, there's, there's more than one in 40 uh, people who will actually be diagnosed with Parkinson's disease during, the, during their lifetime. So it's a very dramatic uh, situation and uh, part of the reason why it has been so challenging uh, to understand these molecular mechanisms is because many of the tools that we have at our disposition for studying proteins work best for well um, uh, soluble proteins in the monomeric uh, uh, states. But actually in these diseases, there's typically not a problem with the protein itself, but there's rather a problem with the way that it associates with other proteins. And this is an area which has been incredibly challenging to study from a fundamental point of view. And that's why we have uh, set up here in Cambridge, um, a center, the Cambridge Center for Misfolding uh, Diseases, uh, to study this phenomenon really in an integrated way from a mechanistic and molecular point of view. So when she set up the center about 10 years ago, with my uh, very good uh, colleagues, Chris Dobson and Michaela Vendruskola at the time. Uh, and I now have the pleasure of co-directing this center with Michaela Vendruskola. And the center really brings together um, about 100 researchers by now with very different backgrounds, all areas of chemistry, but also biology, biomedical sciences, physics, engineering. And what we do is we really look at this problem of protein misfolding, aggregation, dementia, protein misfolding diseases, from an integrated point of view, and in particular, by using and developing new tools based on physical sciences to actually understand the molecular uh, mechanisms and the driving forces of how proteins undergo these transitions to form uh, toxic structures. And so what I'll do today is I'll share with you some examples, of the types of methods that we develop and some of the insights and discoveries that have come out of this program over the past 10 years. And I will then share some thoughts about uh, how this program can evolve in uh, the future. So one of the very fundamental questions in this uh, space is really that of uh, the mechanism. And of course, as physical scientists, this is something that we're very used to asking, what is the mechanism of a process? And chemistry, of course, is very well equipped to deal with these types of, these types of questions. And so I know many of the people who have joined uh, the seminar uh, today uh, have actually had um, 
uh, have, have been in uh, lectures on, on physical chemistry. Some, some people actually have even uh, taught physical chemistry. So what we teach a course our undergraduate students is in order to find mechanisms in other areas of chemistry, what we do is we use the tool of chemical kinetics. So this is really the gold standard uh, technology by which we can determine uh, the mechanisms. So what we've done here in Cambridge over the past 10, 15 years is to really try and take this uh, tool, which has worked so well in other areas of chemistry, and try and adapt it and use it to really drill down and discover some of the mechanisms that underpin the aggregation of proteins in, in disease. So I'll show you a little bit how this works. And I will do this on the basis of the A-beta peptide, which is associated with Alzheimer's disease. So this is typically the way our experiments work. So under in vitro conditions in a test tube, uh, we can purify this disease um, a relevant protein and we can monitor it as a function of time. So here we're tracking what fraction of the protein exists in aggregated form. So initially everything is in the soluble healthy form. As we wait as a function of time, uh, these proteins start to undergo this uh, misbehavior and form uh, amyloid fibers. And at the end, all of the proteins have formed amyloid fibers. We can do this with different levels of protein concentration. So the further to the left, we increase the protein concentration, the more rapid this uh, process becomes. And here, of course, we work with protein concentrations which are actually much higher than those that uh, occur in the central nervous system. And this is why this process takes several hours rather than uh, several uh, years in the case of uh, aggregation in uh, Alzheimer's disease. And now what we can start to do is we can really start to ask questions about the mechanism. So how did this happen? How did proteins go from the soluble states into these aggregated forms? What we can do is we can formulate specific rate laws. So this is the formalism of chemical kinetics. We can take a specific mechanism. Here, for example, we take a mechanism where the aggregates are formed by primary nucleation, just monomers clumping together to form one of these toxic um, aggregates. And so we can see what this looks like. We can compare this rate law. You can see the solid lines. This is the kinetic rate law. We can compare that with experimental data. It sort of captures qualitatively the process of forming these high molecular weight species, but it doesn't really describe the detailed molecular mechanism. So then we can uh, interrogate different types of mechanisms. So maybe, maybe these aggregates in Alzheimer's disease, maybe they multiply the same way as prions, maybe they fragment. Uh, is, that, is that what's happening? And again, these mechanistic tools allow us actually now to test these specific hypotheses. And so let's test that. So we can write down the rate law for fragmentation driven growth. And this is the best fit that we can get to the data using this type of rate law. And you can see this is not what happens in Alzheimer's disease. These aggregates don't multiply through simple uh, fragmentation. So what could be happening? Uh, well, if the aggregates are not formed from monomeric protein and they're not formed from aggregated protein, the only physically meaningful uh, possibility that's left is it has to involve both of these uh, components, monomeric and aggregated protein. And this is uh, what's known as secondary nucleation. And again, we can test whether this is what's happening by taking this mechanism, writing down the rate law, and comparing with experimental data. And you can see that this describes exactly what's happening in the system. And so by doing uh, this type of analysis and, and using this type of uh, tools, we've actually managed to discover something quite interesting about the network of processes that drive the aggregation of A-beta peptide in Alzheimer's disease. In particular, what this analysis shows is as soon as um, a few of these monomers come together by primary nucleation to form one of these um, aggregates, one of these pathological aggregates, this is now suddenly very dangerous because this aggregate has now the propensity to catalyze the formation of ever more aggregates due to the secondary nucleation process. So here on the surface of this aggregate, a new uh, daughter fiber can grow, which can then go back and catalyze in its own the formation of ever more uh, aggregates. So this is a very dangerous process. If biology doesn't manage to stop this process at a very early stage, uh, this will become increasingly difficult to stop. And we think this is really one of the features why these protein aggregation uh, processes are so challenging for biology to curtail uh, once they have started in the context of disease. And it turns out that what's particularly damaging is not even these very high molecular weight uh, amyloid, amyloid fibers. They, in many cases, they can be relatively invert, inert, uh, but it's really the, the oligomeric species, uh, which are the structures just after a new fiber has aggregated, when the structures are still small, these are oligomeric species, and it turns out that they have exactly the right size um, and indeed uh, physicochemical properties to interfere with very fundamental features of cellular behavior, including even membrane integrity. And of course, for sensitive, neuro for sensitive um, cells such as neurons, this is uh, very problematic. And these are really the species which trigger a cascade of aberrant uh, events, which ultimately lead uh, to neuronal uh, death.
So it turns out actually, uh, fortunately, uh, that we have in our bodies a series of uh, molecules, molecular chaperones, which have evolved to recognize these misfolded proteins rapidly and try and prevent them uh, from causing further damage. And so we spent a lot of uh, time over the past uh, 10 years or so trying to understand how these molecules work and what exactly do they, do they recognize. I'll show you some examples here. And this is motivated by the very general question, uh, namely in this nonlinear network with lots of different processes which happen in this aggregation pathway, which ones would it be particularly helpful uh, to inhibit, either for natural molecule or indeed for therapeutic? And so the way we do this is again by using uh, tools from uh, physical chemistry, chemical kinetics, and I'll, I'll show you how this, I'll show you how we've approached this problem. So this is what happens uh, for an uninhibited reaction. So this is again, the beta peptide aggregating to form amyloid fibers. And if we now inhibit the primary nucleation step, we see a slightly different uh, profile. And so we could ask, is this actually a useful uh, thing uh, to do? Uh, is this a useful, useful process to inhibit? Well, let's have a look. Uh, we can now uh, compute uh, the, the uh, quantity of these toxic uh, oligomers. And it turns out it doesn't actually really affect the overall amount of oligomers that are formed. The only thing that it does is it delays this peak uh, slightly. So of course, if one is able to do this in a very effective manner, then one might be able to delay this oligomer peak enough uh, that it would be significant in a, a disease intervention context. But this type of analysis suggests that it's probably going to be quite challenging to, to achieve a significant reduction. So let's think about some other process that we might uh, be able to inhibit. For example, the elongation of these aggregates, their further growth. So let's have a look. So here, this is what the profile would look like. This is uninhibited. This is inhibiting elongation, slightly different profile. Is this a helpful thing to do? Well, it turns out that actually in many cases, this is actually a damaging uh, thing to do. So that can be actually an increase in the concentration of oligomers. And this is because if we're inhibiting the growth of the relatively inert high molecular species, weight species, there's now more monomers available, uh, which can nucleate on the sides of the existing aggregates to form toxic oligomers. So it can actually result in an increase uh, in the concentration of toxic species. And it turns out that the process which is actually really effective at reducing the concentration of oligomers is if we manage somehow to inhibit the secondary nucleation uh, process here, and that, if, if we do the calculation, that actually very significantly decreases the concentration of toxic oligomers. And, and this is something which uh, can be rationalized by the fact that this is really a process which generates the oligomers. So by inhibiting this secondary nucleation process, we're really turning off uh, these, these oligomers really at the source, where we're preventing uh, the very, uh, very formation. So this is a very effective mechanism in principle. So now, uh, does biology do this? Can we find molecules which, which have these different modes of action? So what we do is we take these kinetic profiles and we now compare with experiments where we carry out this aggregation reaction in the presence of other uh, components. And this is one example here uh, where we uh, looked at a particular chaperone. This is the Bricos chaperone associated with British dementia. And you can see here, these, these uh, on the background, you can see these are experimental data in the presence of increasing concentrations of the chaperone. So it inhibits the reaction. And you can see here clearly how, how the data match exactly with the fingerprint of inhibiting uh, secondary nucleation. So this is really a naturally occurring molecule, uh, which effectively very um, efficacious, it has a very high efficacy in inhibiting uh, uh, the secondary nucleation process. So you could then ask, well, is this actually beneficial for biological functionality? Does this get rid of some of the toxicity associated with protein aggregation? And we can test this in a variety of different ways. This is looking at uh, toxicity in a cell experiment. And what happens here is, uh, of course, when we expose these cells to aggregating uh, protein, in this case, the beta peptide associated with Alzheimer's disease, we see this a significant increase in toxicity. So higher values here are increased levels of cellular toxicity. And we see by adding this uh, chaperone, we see a significant rescue of these toxicities. The toxicity goes, goes down. And actually, in cases where we even provide some preformed fibers, in addition to the monomeric peptide, we're now really enhancing uh, the creation of, uh, of new oligomers. So we have the catalytic surface, we have the monomeric species. There's really a very high level of oligomer generation here, which you can see as an increase in the toxicity. And even in this challenging scenario, the chaperone is able to rescue uh, this, um, uh, this toxicity. So this is clearly a very interesting uh, molecule. So this is really able to uh, prevent the formation of these highly toxic uh, species in aggregating proteins. So, so we, we wanted to actually try and understand 
what does this chaperone do? How does it work? And it turns out that this is quite a challenging system to study. So these types of systems have a very high level of heterogeneity. There's monomeric uh, peptide, aggregated peptide, oligomeric peptide, the chaperone, and it can bind to any one of these species. So these are systems which are heterogeneous, quite challenging to look at using conventional um, experimental techniques. So a big part of what we do of our research here is to actually develop new ways of probing interactions uh, which can actually cope with this level of heterogeneity. And I'll just show you one example, uh, which is based on fundamentally new types of experiments uh, which one can design uh, on small uh, scales. And this is based on the fact that actually behavior of fluids becomes fundamentally different when they're confined to very, very small uh, scales. The easiest way to see this is to look at what happens for fluids on large scales. So this is a simple experiment here, uh, pouring milk into uh, coffee, which is one of my favorite uh, experiments. And so you can see what happens. This is something that doesn't surprise us if we pour milk into, into coffee. We see uh, this turbulent uh, convective mixing, so both of these fluids, uh, fluids mix. But this doesn't have to be uh, the way that fluids behave. And actually, uh, you can even see this on uh, macroscopic scales if you work with very viscous uh, fluids. So here, corn syrup. If you put dyes, uh, these uh, few dyes into, into corn syrup, and now uh, mix again here by uh, turning, this, turning this handle. So this is very similar to what happens on the, on the left-hand side, the fluids simply mix. But what happens now if you turn the handle the other way around is something quite surprising. It turns out that the fluids actually unmix. So this is very surprising. So this is not what we would expect uh, for fluids from our everyday life. And this is indeed not what would happen here. So once you mix the milk into the coffee, there's no way to unmix uh, these fluids again. So what's happening here? Well, it turns out that uh, there's actually a, in some sense, hidden uh, regime for fluid behavior, which is controlled by this uh, parameter here, the Reynolds number. And when this number is large, uh, this is normally what we, what we think of as fluid behavior, things mix, everything is turbulent, there's convective mixing. But actually, if this number becomes small, then fluids are no longer able to mix in a turbulent way. And here, this has been achieved by making this viscosity here very large. That makes, of course, this number very small. But you can see here that if we just make the size of the system in which we do these experiments very small, uh, that actually uh, leads to the same type of very predictable fluid uh, behavior. And that has allowed us to generate fundamentally new types of ways of probing these highly heterogeneous uh, protein systems. And I'll show you one example here. Where what we do is we bring in our analyte uh, system here from the top. So this is now proteins and uh, the chaperone system. So we bring it here from the top. And what happens is the channel dimensions here are of the order of tens of microns. So this is a fraction of the size of the human, uh, human hair. And what happens is from the bottom, we also bring a stream of uh, water or buffer. And if we did this on large scales, what would happen is everything would just mix and this wouldn't be a very interesting experiment. But on these very small scales, what happens is these two streams flow very happily next to each other. There's in some sense not enough space for them to mix. What that means is the only way that the molecules can get from the top to the bottom is purely by diffusion. And now, of course, what that means is if we measure, and we do this uh, routinely in our lab, measure after a couple of seconds only of diffusion time here, we measure how many molecules have ended up here and how many molecules have ended up here. This gives us a really a good way to measure the sizes, in this case, the hydrodynamic radius, technically, uh, of, these, of these molecules. And now, of course, if these molecules interact with other species, for example, here with a binding partner, what now happens is their size has changed, the size has increased, and we can measure this very easily in this increased hydrodynamic uh, radius. And so this is a platform which now allows us to probe very readily the interactions between uh, chaperones and indeed other binders and uh, disease-associated protein aggregates. Now, I'll share some recent uh, results on, on, on this, which, which give really, um, in our view, fascinating insights into the mode of action of these chaperones. So when we do this experiment, this exact experiment, using these microfluidic uh, platforms um, that we've developed here in Cambridge. And we asked the question, what is the size of these molecules? This is now tracking the size of this naturally occurring chaperone uh, molecule. So we see that most of these chaperones have this type of size here, of the order of slightly more than uh, 10 uh, angstroms, uh, just, just over a nanometer, which is sort of the size that one would expect uh, for proteins of this uh, molecular weight. But actually, if we also now add um, this disease-related uh, peptide, a beta, and allow it to aggregate, we see a second population here of molecular chaperones, which have a much, much larger size. So why is that? Well, uh, there must be the chaperones, because this is the species that we're tracking. So why do they have such a large molecular weight? It's because they have actually bound and recognized these misfolded uh, proteins, um, misfolded proteins here. They're really physically binding uh, to the misfolded proteins. 
And in fact, by using this type of uh, technology, what we can do is we can do um, experiments which look like very much like standard uh, binding binding curves. We can look at the fraction of bound um, chaperone as a function of the concentration of the chaperone. And, and this gives us insights into how tightly they bind. And it turns out that, that indeed they, they bind with a very high, um, a very high affinity uh, to, these, uh, uh, to these aggregates. But what's even more interesting is these types of measurements where all of the species are remaining in solution allow us to actually quantify the relative stoichiometry. So what I mean by that is, is how many of these protective chaperone molecules bind uh, uh, onto each one of the misfolded um, A-beta uh, A -beta molecules. And these results actually revealed something very surprising. So it revealed that under conditions where we have suppression of 99% of the generation of the oligomers, this actually only requires less than one in a hundred of these A-beta molecules here in the fiber to be protected uh, by uh, this naturally occurring chaperone. So, so this, is really a, this is really fascinating. I think it gives us insights into, into how nature is able to cope very effectively with this aggregation uh, problem uh, in a very, sometimes economical way. It really recognizes the very specific sites which are problematic and which catalyze the formation of these toxic uh, oligomers. So these are really insights uh, which we're increasingly uh, sort of pushing forwards uh, to really try and gain uh, an understanding of how biology uh, deals with these issues and manages to keep us healthy for the vast majority of our lives. As a very final uh, point, I would like to uh, sort of show how we're now using many of these methods to actually profile and understand uh, existing therapeutic molecules and try and understand their limitations and also provide inspiration for the development of future generations of therapeutics. So of course, because of its association with Alzheimer's disease, there'll be many attempts to generate in particular antibodies which target this uh, protein. So what we've done here, uh, again, together with uh, collaborators, uh, is to take four of these antibodies, which have all gone through clinical uh, studies, phase three clinical trials, and we now ask the question, what exactly do they do? And so we can profile them uh, based on this type of fingerprint, uh, where we look at uh, sort of five key features using the techniques that I've just uh, shown you. We look at how they affect the primary nucleation, the, the initial stage when the, when the aggregates form, how they affect the growth of the aggregates. So this is the step which might be potentially damaging and how they affect secondary nucleation, which is this process which really generates toxic oligomers. And also by using the microfluidic experiments, we can see how these therapeutic molecules bind to the diseased form of the peptide versus the monomeric uh, form. And, and the more uh, this sort of um, diagram here points to the corners, the higher the efficacy of the molecule is in that particular dimension. So what we see by using these types of techniques is that actually all of these molecules do something different. Even though they all went through the clinic, with nominally the same target, the A-beta peptide in Alzheimer's disease, we actually discovered that they all do something very uh, different. And some of them have sort of modes of action, which based on detailed mechanistic analysis, might, we, we might predict to be quite challenging. For example, this one here uh, binds uh, specifically to the monomeric form, not the diseased form, and it inhibits the very uh, early primary nucleation rather than the secondary nucleation process, which generates most of the toxic oligomers. So based on our mechanistic analysis, this, this is probably a mode of action which is actually quite challenging uh, uh, to really develop into a really effective uh, uh, therapeutic. However, one of these molecules, this one here, uh, actually had exactly the same fingerprint as this naturally occurring Brikos uh, chaperone. Uh, and this molecule here, late last year, became the very first molecule which was ever um, approved by the FDA in the United States uh, for disease modifying treatment of, of Alzheimer's disease. So it was a relatively controversial process, uh, partly because the efficacy of this, uh, this molecule uh, is, is maybe not as high as it, as it could be, but based on these types of data, we can actually clearly see why this molecule has a fundamentally different fingerprint and mechanism of action than any of the other molecules which have been tried uh, before it. And crucially, these types of measurements provide inspiration and direction for us to now go on and use these learnings to develop molecules which even more closely mimic uh, the action of naturally occurring protective uh, molecules, for example, by increasing uh, the efficacy at which they inhibit uh, some of these crucial uh, processes. So, so this is, th these are sort of some ideas that I wanted to uh, share with you. So really here uh, in Cambridge, we're looking at this um, really hugely uh, significant problem of protein aggregation and its connection with diseases from a very different point of view than the vast majority of the work in this area uh, so far. And, and we're, we're really not looking at it only as a, as a sort of biological and biomedical problem, but really using the tools of physical sciences, drilling down to the fundamental molecular mechanisms and an understanding 
of the molecular processes by which proteins misbehave and ultimately give rise to pathological structures. We're also using these tools to understand how our bodies can actually uh, prevent uh, this process from, from happening for the vast majority of our lives and keep us healthy. And molecular chaperones are, are some of the key components uh, involved in these processes. We're increasing understanding how these chaperones work. And this gives us inspiration and direction for developing uh, future therapeutics uh, and indeed evaluating uh, the potential of currently existing, uh, existing therapeutics. Uh, so with that, I would like to hand over to uh, Nadia, uh, who will um, tell us about some of the really fantastic work that she has already been uh, able to carry out here uh, in Cambridge on understanding the liquid uh, state of liquid state of proteins. Uh, this is a functional state which cells organize for use for organizing uh, molecular matter, both inside the you know, nucleus, but also in the cytoplasm. Uh, but what's interesting is that this is actually quite a dangerous state for proteins because in these liquid states, the molecules are present at very high densities. And so there's an even greater risk for these types of inappropriate uh, interactions. And what we've discovered is that these systems are really on the edge of forming uh, these solid uh, disease related uh, phases. So with that, uh, over to you, uh, Nadia. Thanks, Thomas. All right, it's, um, it's, it's nice to talk to you all. Um, I'm Nadia and I'm a PhD student in uh, Professor Knoll's group. Um, and so I'm here in his group for my PhD. Um, before I started working on my PhD, um, I studied in the Netherlands and the USA. And it's been, it's been really great to be, be a member of uh, Professor Knoll's lab. Um, I've been here working now for one and a half years. And so I think Thomas gave a really good overview of sort of what the lab has been working on for the last uh, 10 years. Um, and he mentioned, I think, that um, many, many people have worked on this. And so I'll give you sort of a perspective of what I suppose uh, a single person uh, like me can work on. So I wanted to, to, to show you this image here on the left of what uh, a human cell looks like, or at least how I was taught that a human cell looks like. So this picture is from my, from my high school biology book. Um, so this was the first time I learned about human cells and how they work in 2010. And as you can see, they have quite a few different components inside of them. But actually, there are a lot more components in the cell, and I learned this later. Um, the cell here on the right contains many more components than the one here on the left. And all of these are actually liquids that are rich in protein. And so these liquids, Thomas already mentioned this a bit, um, previously, we thought that healthy cells contained proteins which interact with each other, and that if you go from them in liquid to them in solid, you get these aggregates or fibrils, and that these basically are the cause for neurodegenerative disease. And what we found out in recent years is that there's actually a second state, which is proteins in these liquids. So they're basically liquids that are really dense in protein, which actually play a really large role in the cell and explains why we're finding all of these new uh, compartments in the cell. And so what we were wondering was sort of what do all these liquids do? And also since these liquids have so much protein in them, so concentrated, could actually this be a way of making these aggregates? Um, and so um, I've been working a lot on these protein liquids and finding out how we can make sure that the proteins don't become solid, but stay functional. So to give you an idea sort of of scale, uh, here on the left, we have a picture of a, a rather tall gentleman, two meters, I've estimated him to be. Um, and every time when we zoom in further onto his hand and fingertip and then fingerprint, we move, basically, we zoom in 10 times each time until we end up with a cell and a protein liquid. And so these protein liquids are really rather small, 20 micron, 20 micrometer. And so to actually study these, we need microscopes and microfluidics. And so it's been really um, exciting for me to learn about these techniques that are so small that you can't see them. Um, and so here you can see um, that we make sort of these really small droplets, which you can't see by eye actually. And basically these droplets are an aqueous solution inside of oil. And this is basically an artificial cell. And so here you can see an image of these artificial cells. 
Um, and inside of them, they have these, these red droplets, which are the protein liquids. And so basically this allows me to, to study these protein liquids inside of a, an artificial cell. And so I can change the environment and see sort of how different factors affect these, these protein liquids uh, and their solidification and you know, their, their way to becoming aggregates. Um, and so from learning about these protein liquids and artificial cells, we can then move on to these images here on the bottom where you can see these protein liquids in, in real cells. So the, the bright spots are the protein liquids and the, the larger structures are actually two cells next to each other. And so it's been really exciting to sort of work on this field, um, especially since we're finding so many, like we're discovering so many new things. Um, and so what you see on this slide here are uh, also these protein liquids, um, but actually, so this is sort of what I found during my PhD um, is that these, protein liquids have actually a really interesting internal structure. So I'll play this video over here where you can see sort of the, the large green protein liquid. And then inside you can see these bubbles of other liquids. And over time, so you can see here the time in minutes, these other liquids, they merge with each other and they move around. Um, and it's really interesting to see because sort of people have observed in cells that these protein liquids also have sort of an internal structure, um, but it's not really clear how that is important for their function or how it prevents them from becoming aggregates or how it keeps them functional. Um, and so that is what I'm working on a lot at the moment. Um, and all of this great research has been done here at Cambridge Chemistry, and I'm really grateful to, to be working here. I want to thank Thomas who has created such a great research environment. Um, and I'm really happy to be a part of that. Uh, Thomas showed you a list of all the people working in the lab and all of our collaborators. And so all of these people and facilities really make it possible for, for me to sort of ask it questions that I'm interested in and that are important for solving disease and understanding cells. Um, and speaking of that, I'd like to thank Sven as well, uh, Sven Royal supports my research, um, which is really great because it means that we better understand neurodegenerative disease and also learn to, um, to yeah, we, we basically find out how cells work in greater detail. Um, and on a personal level, Sven supports my, basically funds my education, which I'm really grateful for. And he also helps me to prepare for a career in research.